Wellington. We most expect our big one to hit. How ready are we? Our lifelines, our buildings, our people. Seismologists still can't confirm whether the eight quakes so far this week are leading to the big one. Scientists think we could be entering another violent earth storm season. For Wellington, 30 kilometers below ground, the Pacific plate crushes beneath the Australian plate. One day, the pressure will become too great. The plates will suddenly unstick, causing a monumental earthquake. This squeezing together has also caused fault lines within Wellington, running from deep below up to the surface. These fault lines cut up the Wellington region like slices of bread. There are six known major faults, every one a threat. But it's the Wellington fault, cutting off and isolating the city, scientists expect to kick off the big one. Wellington, its people and buildings, will be gripped by an earth storm that will test the city to the limit. To clear Slip in Arthur's Pass in 1994 took three weeks. That scale of slipping will occur all the way from the bottom of Naya Gorge, right the way through beyond Tighter Gorge, right the way over the Rimutaka Incline. Wellington will be strangled. At the very time she's crying out for help, the rest of New Zealand will be barred from entry. In a major event, we have no uh, belief that we will be able to keep our roading system open. A very significant weak point is out on the coast road where those uh, huge hillsides that rise up there are very unstable. Our big problem is that currently there's very little plant in Wellington. The nearest large fleets of bulldozers and scrapers are in Hawke's Bay. The problem is frightening. 500 contractors working full time would take more than a year to repair just 50 kilometres of roads and a dozen bridges. In Wellington, I don't believe there's a significant sized bulldozer located in the Wellington region right at this moment. Wellington Airport is out of action with the runway extensively damaged. Wellington will be desperate for plane loads of supplies. If access to the harbour is blocked too, airdrops may be the only option left. Reports are coming in of many buildings severely damaged. We now know all roads out of Wellington City are impassable. In Northridge and Kobe, motorway spans dropped and columns keeled over. Not wanting to see a repeat, engineers in New Zealand are working frantically to improve motorway links and columns. But in Wellington, nothing can stop the fault pulling the ground apart. We can now confirm the earthquake was a massive magnitude 7.6. Columns may also tip over because of liquefaction. That affects the whole of the reclaimed area of Wellington, which is the area between the hills and the sea, right along Lambton Quay, right down Courtney Place. And that affects the whole of the lower end of the Hutt Valley. Wellington shorelines and valleys will have huge liquefaction problems, breaking underground pipes and roads alike. In the 1931 Napier earthquake, most access roads were cut and bridges were destroyed or damaged along with the pipes they carried. In Wellington, bridges are not only carry cars and trucks, they bring in all the city's water as well. On its way into Wellington, the water crosses the fault twice. The way in from Wainuimata, it crosses the fault once. Wellington City uses 80 million litres of water a day. If the lines are broken, this water will have to be found elsewhere. The City of Wellington only holds one day's supply. We have to face the facts there may be significant water shortages in Wellington. Even if water can get here by ship, two fully laden tankers would need to tie up every day to meet the usual demand. The earthquake has caused multiple breaks in Wellington's water mains. Raw sewage is pouring onto many streets. Police are evacuating people from the worst affected areas. Three quarters of the sewers in Wellington are over 50 years old and clay drains are still used in places. Wellington Hills will help a little. There, hard ground will prevent a lot of the breakage Christchurch will suffer. In Wellington, 
Reticulated or understreet piping of gas is everywhere. However, gas lines are now being upgraded to flexible plastic pipes with indestructible joints designed to survive the worst earthquake. Well, in Kobe they had also these pipelines, the same technology, and they had, in fact they had no single failure on the plastic system there. At Kobe, there were some 160 separate fires. One third were blamed on gas. But things could have been a lot worse if it wasn't for a very simple device, seldom used here. In Kobe, there are meters available with automatic cutoff. They respond to a seismic action. We are looking uh, in more detail into these uh, special meters. They are very expensive, though. Should this volatile fuel be banned in high-risk earthquake zones like Wellington? No, we don't believe in the, any extra danger of gas compared to other fuels. Gas is volatile. That's why it's used as a fuel. But the big danger comes from gas is that, generally speaking, you do not know the flammability range that the gas is in, and sooner or later it will reach an ignition source and it will ignite, and usually with devastating results. There will be many causes of fire, from gas to electrical sparks and tipped heaters in winter. In Kobe, the fire service was severely criticised for not responding faster and saving more lives. New Zealand is probably more prepared but that doesn't mean to say that we won't be overwhelmed either and we have to look at alternative means of, of obtaining water, whether it be by um, tankers, the use of helicopters and monsoon nuggets, and large diameter hose. There will be far too few trying to do far too much. Fire is now the biggest problem facing rescue services. There is a real danger the entire business district could be burnt to the ground. There have been building collapses all over Wellington. We still have no word on casualties, but police say they expect to find most in the lower harbour district. New buildings can also collapse. In many Kobe buildings, weak columns collapsed. There were many deaths and injuries. The same sort of thing will happen in New Zealand to hundreds of buildings designed between 1935 and 1975. Buildings of this age are significantly weaker. Many more would die than in a whole block of old brick buildings down the road if just one 12-storey 60s building collapsed. For Wellington, scientists have worked out how many building deaths are likely in a major earthquake. Graham Agate has developed a computer program that looks at fatalities for a 7.5 magnitude quake on the Wellington Fault. Again, this is the Wellington Fault running along here. The daytime scenario, we've got a, a large number of people concentrated in, in the uh, central business district. The absolute numbers that are calculated in terms of fatalities was 230. Other scientists estimate over 500 daytime deaths. One or two high-rises and a crowded picture theatre would reach this figure alone. Police have warned people to stay well away from the terrace because of the danger of collapsing buildings. Fires in the central business district are finally out. Out in the suburbs, fires are still burning out of control with at least one shopping centre ablaze. Scientists have now identified another important factor, the soils on which buildings stand. Graham Agat has also developed a computer programme that looks at city soils, including those beneath Wellington Hospital. The hospital was sited on a site that we expect to receive at least um, moderate to severe shaking intensities during a scenario to earthquake. A Scenario 2 quake is a 7.5 on the Wellington Fault. John Tabor is interested in how violently Wellington buildings on soft soils will shake in a large quake. To find out, he studies small earthquakes. The ambulance bay was where John Tabor placed one of his earthquake recorders. Uh, it's thin soil but, but shakes quite a bit, so what that means is for small earthquakes it's increasing the shaking by a factor of three or four. Wellington Hospital's Ridderford Street building also appears to have a resonant frequency problem. If the earthquake is far away and you have this resonance effect between the building and the soil, then perhaps you're getting closer to that maximum. Scientists are blaming the building collapse at Wellington Hospital on extreme shaking caused by the soil below. Casualties from Wellington's devastating earthquake are now being flown to Palmerston North by helicopter. The capital's own hospitals are unable to accept any more injured patients. In New Zealand, unsafe structures are still being built. Engineers at Canterbury University are working to identify dangerous designs. Tilt-up has become a very common form of construction. It's where the concrete is cast uh, flat on the ground as, as 
uh, horizontal panels, and then the panels are actually tilted up on one edge. In Northridge, walls fell over and roofs fell in on stores and warehouses. So there was damage at Northridge, uh, probably not as much as you might see uh, in New Zealand, where there's far more of that type of construction used. Well, it's used for up, typically up from one to three-storey buildings. They could be office buildings, apartment buildings, uh, cinemas, for example. So you're saying a cinema could actually collapse? Could do, if the details are not adequate, yes. Many new supermarkets are also tilt-ups. How could such a dangerous situation happen? They're using techniques which are, are not in codes, but they're based on their own engineering judgment. D don't you think that engineering peers should assess building designs before they become common practice? Oh, well, of course, the, these uh, designs are looked at by the local authorities. They often just rubber stamp engineers. Perhaps. So who's doing the checking? Well, I mean, it's really up to the engineer, isn't it, to to produce a good design. An engineer could be pressured to come up with a low-cost design. Yes, there's a problem there. But the most devastating cost is the large number of dead, injured and homeless. In Napier, 257 died and others were forced to live in tent towns. If you've got to suddenly repair 10,000 houses, you just can't do it all at once. And a lot of people may have to face the fact that for quite a long time, they've been living in the open in the sports stadiums, in the parks, or living in school halls. Within weeks, 8,000 people had left the region. If this was Wellington today, its road north would be crammed with 100,000 people looking for shelter. Soon, one of our cities will be hit hard. It could cost the country tens of billions of dollars, and the numbers of serious injuries, missing people and deaths could be measured in their thousands. Wellington is painfully aware of the inevitable big one. The real question is one of money. Do we spend for the future or wait until it happens?